So I'm coming up with this idea of sustainable economics, which is shorthand for trying to find the appropriate level of balance between capital and labor. Thus far, what we have within most of the West has been an effort to figure out a way to drive labor costs to zero as much as possible in order to favor capital and therefore development. And development is what you see anywhere you go in the West. And unfortunately, thus far, that development has been suburban, suburban homes, uh, you know, just tracts of land dedicated to housing away from a city center and away from city hall. Which in some, which if you think about it, divorces in a sense, the government from the people. But in any case, that's been the primary development model. You favor capital, and then one day you wake up, and instead of just having unused land, you've got a baseball field somewhere, a park, a shopping mall. That's been, again, another heavily favored way of promoting development because of sales taxes that accrue to local governments from the sales in those shopping malls. So anywhere you go in the West, in fact, these days, anywhere, really, you're going to have a, de a development model that's based on not necessarily a sustainable system, but one that favors real estate development, both in terms of shopping malls and homes and capital in the sense that capital is attempting to spread, not just domestically, but all over the world in order to maximize returns and its own influence. So that's been the prevailing model. And that's why, if you think about it, because that's been the prevailing model of development, a, a lot of Western cities have become unlivable. Um, not just because of environmental reasons, but because if you're favoring capital, which needs a return on investment, at least a reasonable one, at an appropriate risk, what's really happening is you're building these homes and these suburban tracks in a way that doesn't necessarily maximize quality of life, but output. If you notice, these, these homes do have backyards, uh, but, you know, for the most part, you're, you're dealing with a system that's designed to maximize profit by putting homes very close together. And that's typically the case with suburbia and the suburban development model, is to try to maximize not only upkeep by putting all the homes together in one place, uh, therefore allowing a fairly simple grid system with the streets and everything else and water supplies and so on. What's really happening is you're also trying to maximize the return on investment per square foot. And when that fails, as you have to go closer to the city center, you see a different development model. You see one that involves high rises, that involves condos and so on and so forth. In countries with large populations, billions of people, and, and not much land, or just not much land, like Hong Kong, the condo model is favored, the high-rise model is favored. You don't really have the opportunity to separate the government from the people by building all these sort of separate land tracks that, that for the most part, house people in ways that tend to separate them, not just politically, but also in terms of lifestyle. So you have maybe a younger population in the city center, then you've got an older population or population that wants a family moving to the suburban tracks. You put all these things together and you've got a recipe for segregation, not just based on race, which was, which was enshrined in law, but based on so many different factors that eventually you're not dealing with a sustainable governmental system and therefore you're not dealing with a sustainable banking system or a sustainable economic system. And the key to remember is that the way that we've gotten here has been precisely by driving labor costs down to zero. And if you can get labor costs down to zero, you're, you're of course going to be more developed than your competition that has to pay for labor or that has to pay a reasonable rate for that labor. And so growth will be slower to the extent that labor is treated more fairly than the competition.
that's something that a lot of people don't necessarily understand. They think they can have the best of both worlds. That's just not possible. It may be possible in the future as technology makes, drives down the costs of supplies and, and you know, a lot, a lot of other things. But as we're finding out, you know, monopolies still exist all over the world. Countries are not really happy to give those, give up monopolies to the extent that they can have them. And that, that's true whether it's China's grip on the solar industry um, or rare earth minerals. Uh, that's true whether it's the United States and oil and so on and so forth. Now, so you can see how this emphasis on capital can lead to a reaction in the development paradigm. And that reaction, of course, would favor manual labor. It would favor people who are in the process of building development, but who are not necessarily being fairly compensated because the development model is attempting to prioritize growth over fairness under the idea that if you have growth, eventually everyone will catch up, eventually everyone will be made better off, even if their bank accounts are vastly different. And to some extent, that's also true. You know, there's no question that the variety of consumer products in the West, at least in the past, you know, would be far more than anything that would have been available under, say, the Soviet Union or in East Germany. Now, that's in the past. Now, what I've just talked about, really, if you've been paying attention, has been a couple of things. It's been the hammer and the sickle. That's, what's, that's what characterized the Soviet Union, this idea of manual labor over capital. And that's not to say the Soviet Union didn't try to have the same globalized economic system as the United States. It entered into a treaty with Vietnam, possibly a protectorate, to make Vietnam one of its protectorates. And the question is, why would it do that unless it wanted to have access to a port? And of course, it was not able to live up to the terms of that treaty uh, because the United States and then China essentially align, uh, aligned themselves to protect their existing ports, with the United States being concerned about Singapore and China, of course, being concerned about uh, Vietnam and so on and so forth. You've got, of course, the French in Vietnam as well. And of course, they are part of NATO, I believe, or at least part of a trading system that involves the EU or Europe and the United States. We see a reaction to let's say, this development model that centers on manual labor and the power of manual labor in order to create more fair terms. And you can see how that's a very romantic notion you know, people against power, people against banks. And that's why that dynamic has continued for quite some time. And the question is whether or not it's a successful dynamic. Because today, everyone relies on banks, everyone relies on debt and loans, everyone relies on a globalized system of trade that occurs on the high seas, which of course requires insurance, which of course requires banks. Now, in these days, technology. Now, when I talked about this idea of labor going down to zero, you may not have, you may not have understood what I was talking about. I was talking about all of this being built on the foundation of slaves. Slavery is the process of driving wages down to zero. And there's no question that the West has benefited tremendously in a development sense compared to its competition because it has managed or it had managed to drive labor costs down to zero. And so there's no question when you put these things together, there's no illusion about why the West has been able to succeed in terms of development, but not necessarily in terms of social cohesion capital doesn't necessarily understand 
social cohesion. It may want to distract you into believing social cohesion exists. And that's what's going on now. You have a lot of distractions. You have a lot of miscommunication. You have a lot of signaling, a lot of show telling. That doesn't necessarily want to deal with the fundamental consequences of a long history of labor mistreatment and a long history of the refusal to own up to that history. And when, when you really look at the law, legal systems that have supported that history, you also have to remember that the fact of the matter is that people, only landowners, were supposed to have the ability to vote. It was never supposed to be a situation where simply being born in the United States, regardless of class, would allow you the right to be a citizen and the right to vote and the right to travel and have all the privileges associated with citizenship. That was never supposed to be the case in the United States because again, everything in the, at the end of the day comes down to economics and the system of the United States was not based on sustainable economics. It was really based on a system of growth, of perpetual growth. And overall, that has been successful. There's no question that one of the wealthiest countries in the world is the United States because it was able to drive labor costs down to zero and prevent equal citizenship, prevent everyone in the country from utilizing the ability to become a full citizen based on the accident of birth. And so a lot of what we're seeing is, number one, in the United States, or just in the West, the shift away from away from the idea that only landowners deserve equal rights. That is still happening today. It's hard to believe that, but when you look at the concentration of, of property, of physical property, it's, it becomes much more obvious that we're still going through that process. And because we're still going through that process, that reaction to that process has been the rise of the other economic system I just talked about, one that wants to favor manual labor. The problem is that manual labor, the, that, that system, right? We're no longer dealing with a, a system that involves primarily tangible products. We're really involved in a system that, that is trying to maximize services and intangible products. And that has consequences because the way that labor has fought has been based on this idea of going on a strike, of shutting down the means of production. And shutting down the means of production has typically involved tangible things. And when you're dealing with intangible things, labor's reaction to the favor, to an economic system that favors development based on capital, as opposed to a more sustainable method, you can see how the systems in place by labor would not be up to the task of trying to resolve what has happened thus far and trying to achieve that balance that I talked about. And so as a result, it shouldn't surprise anyone that we're in a state of flux, particularly at the same time that the West is encountering a different economic model in the rise of China and the resurgence of Russia post I suppose, you know, well, I suppose over the last 15 years, certainly. And you, you see all these different systems coming into place and the fundamental task has to be, if, you're the United, if you are the United States, to try to figure out if you don't want to have an economic system that drives wages down to the lowest common denominator, to the lowest common denominator, what is going to be the alternative system given that we are dealing with a paradigm that has already resulted in physical concentration of ownership in, I believe, that essentially the same number, the same percentage of the population that used to own slaves. The population in this country that used to own slaves that were slave owners, of course, were landowners. They also had to have capital. And that percentage is much smaller than what people think. I believe it's less than 10%. And 
that doesn't mean of course that more people didn't benefit from the from driving wages down to zero uh, of course it doesn't mean that more people didn't benefit from the social consequences and of course you know other issues surrounding that exploitation and of course it doesn't mean that a lot of people didn't suffer along the way and so when you put all these things together look you know you are, you're able to draw a line from the past from a system of economics that favored concentration of ownership and that system of ownership remains to this day because all progress is incremental especially when you're dealing with a system that allows you to concentrate wealth in the top 10 percent or the top five percent and again it's important to make that connection between the percentage of people within the united states and possibly the west that were slave owners and the current unequal wealth paradigm. And once you make that connection, it's a little bit easier to understand economics because you understand that in the short term, and when I say short term, I could be speaking of 100 years or 200 years. In the short term, there is no question that the ability to create a concentration of ownership results in more efficiency and results in the ability to get things done faster and at a higher growth rate. And because of that efficiency, allows a lot of money for marketing, for distractions, for circuses, and so, and so on and so forth. And for the development of a media paradigm that makes all of this look perfectly normal. And it's particularly frustrating if you do believe in sustainable economics to go into another country uh, that has not been able to, or that refused to utilize slavery in order to maximize growth, economic growth, it's particularly frustrating because what you're seeing is the dual problem of number one, not having that's a similar growth rate, but also being held hostage in a sense to the empires prevailing economic paradigm, even if that paradigm is not necessarily a good fit for your own country. And so if you look at a lot of Middle Eastern countries that have been aligned with the United States because of the United States desire to monopolize oil post the OPEC embargo, you look at that and what you're seeing is you know, a system that really doesn't make any sense, especially if you're using, say, air conditioning, if you're using, you know, a system of cooling down the environment that, ba that is based on pushing cold air, that is based on pushing hot air outside of buildings, thereby increasing the overall temperature of the environment. It's not just the Middle East, it's Singapore as well, and so on and so forth. Another ally of the United States that has been wildly successful. And as a result of not directly benefiting from slavery, but being aligned with a power that did. So nothing here is really cut and dry because when you have a leader that has established itself in an economic leadership position, it very much is a case of, you know, the lion coughing and frightening everyone around him. And in many cases, as a result of that power, creating economic alliances that cause overlapping tendencies. But again, those tendencies don't necessarily make everyone better in the long run, unless you have a lot of luck and also you know, a lot of good faith. The idea that things in the end are going to progress, that this idea of all boats rising in the tide, in the quick tide, over time, if you have a good faith belief in that, then these ideas like debt, you know, which eventually can be paid off if it's done responsibly, as Germany did post-World War II, it eventually paid off its debts and was able to create a stable currency. You look at a lot of the physical infrastructure in Germany, it's, quite, it's done quite well. Uh, you look at this idea of the empire being able to share ideas back and forth, what works and what doesn't work, the idea of an empire or a superpower using military 
exercises and just simply just military membership to try to figure out what works and what doesn't work because they've got essentially a group of people that are under contract, in a sense, slaves, because they don't have the freedom to go where they want to go. And there are such large numbers of them that the ability to control the military population, the military membership, also gives people ideas on how to control the general population. That is, that is of course, why most free countries have always had a separation of military leadership and civilian leadership, because the idea is you don't want the military and you don't want this economic system of growth that prioritizes capital above social cohesion to be permanent and to eventually cause a reversal of all the economic gains that have happened as a result of declining social cohesion and general unhappiness. And so when you put all these things together, the idea isn't to align anyone. The idea is to try to figure out a system that works, and at least one that works better than the one in the past. And how do you do that when the system that came before you has been so successful that it's resulted in a concentration of ownership that, for the most part, has, at least on some level, been able to rise everyone's votes on the tide that it, that it itself has created. And how do you do that when you have that concentration of ownership? How do you do that when you have a failure of civilian leadership when compared to the success and the funding of military leadership? How do you do all, how do you both reverse those troublesome trends while at the same time trying to prioritize something that would has been neglected for decades at least, namely social cohesion. That is what people are struggling with right now, all over the world, not just in the West. They're struggling with a, just a tremendous amount of problems because once again, when you have an empire, that empire's actions influence all the entire world, whether or not you're aligned with the country or whether or not you're opposed to the country's ideas. Everyone essentially is caught in the wave. And now I suppose we're trying to figure out how to reduce the turbulence.